He became a millionaire by the age of 30, but ended up in bankruptcy, losing it all by the age of 40. The amazing story of one man driven to the brink of death after becoming the victim of an embezzlement scheme. After planning his own suicide, he turned to God and discovered a secret so powerful that it changed his life forever. How to pray for a financial miracle is more than just one man's story of beating the odds and rebuilding his life after a total financial collapse. It's a book that reveals a life-changing prayer method that anyone can use to find hope during life's darkest financial trials. You will learn how to enlist God's help in solving your financial problems. The biggest prayer mistake most people make when approaching God with a financial need. How prayer can provide you with immediate answers and direction to your most pressing financial issues. How to Pray for a Financial Miracle, an Amazon.com bestseller from James L. Paris, the editor of ChristianMoney.com. How to Pray for a Financial Miracle, available in paperback or for Kindle from Amazon.com. You're listening to Jim Paris Radio. This is Jim Paris Live. Your source for money and political conversation from a Christian perspective. And now your host, the author of more than 20 books and the editor-in-chief of ChristianMoney.com, James L. Paris. All right, hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the broadcast. Uh, full and fair disclosure, we are pre-taping this show uh, because my obligation with the big band that I play in uh, takes me away from the studio at our normal live airtime of Sunday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. This only happens a couple of times a year where it turns out that I'm not going to be able to be sitting in my home studio at 9 o'clock Eastern on a Sunday night, but that's the case uh, this week, so we're pre-taping the show on Friday afternoon. And what we're going to do on this program today is just dedicate the entire program to an update on what is happening with Profitable Sunrise. And if you've been following the story, we've been covering this since February the 12th over on my blog, blog blog.christianmoney.com. And how this all happened was one of my friends, who was an evangelist, he came to visit me in Florida. We went out and spent the day on my boat, and he was just telling me some of the things going on in his life. And he shared with me that he had invested $250 in something called Profitable Sunrise. And as the conversation uh, evolved, he began to tell me that other people he knew had invested, including one of his friends, who had invested $30,000. And the more he told me about this deal where you could make 2% a day on your money and it was focused on Christians, the more interested that I got and the more skeptical and suspicious that I got. So that really, that weekend really started uh, in me uh, a curiosity to find out what is this all about. And the more information that I was able to get on this opportunity of Profitable Sunrise, the more I became convinced that it was a scam. Here's the problem, though. Um, It was so huge, I thought, how could a scam be this big and it's still going? And I picked up the phone and I called up one of the top promoters in the company, Nancy Jo Fraser, who is a lady that lives near Toledo, Ohio. And um, I went toe-to-toe with her on an interview, about 20 minutes, and um, she just told me flat out that this is legal and there's nothing wrong with it and that uh, I don't know what I'm talking about and uh, this is offshore and they're doing hard money loans and on and on and on. And I just hung up the phone and I shook my head and I continued to kind of scratch my head and remained in a confused state about the whole deal. Not that I ever had any wonder, not that I was really wondering or had any questions about it being a scam because I was getting pretty convinced that this deal was a scam. I mean, who pays 2% a day in interest? And uh, the more I looked into it, the more suspicious I got, but I was still confused because, okay, if this is a scam, how is this so huge? And then I met someone by the name of Lynn Edgington, who is the founder of Eagle Research. He's a real scam buster, and uh, we've been talking on and off now for, I think, about a month, and he joins us again on the program uh, to give us an update and to have just a discussion about where in the world uh, this whole thing is at. Uh, Lynn Edgington of Eagle Research, good to have you with us, sir. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for having me back on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Wow, well, a lot of water over the dam at this point, 
And I guess this is a good time here Friday afternoon to be taping this show because a lot of things have happened this week with Profitable Sunrise. Um, if I'm getting my chronological order uh, correct, we were looking at last week we had just one state come out and do a cease and desist order. That was North Carolina. And another state, Alabama, uh, came out and issued a warning, but they didn't issue a cease and desist order. And so what happened after that, Lynn, was all of these promoters and everything said, well, no big deal. You know, it's just a couple of states. And Roman Novak, the founder of Profitable Sunrise, he'll go to North Carolina and make everything right. This is really not a big deal. Let's all just move forward. No new recruiting in North Carolina. But otherwise, business as usual. And now this week, Lynn, I'll let you uh, do the honors. Tell us what in the world began to happen uh, in the last uh, two to three business days. Well, actually, we can say the bottom dropped out of Profitable Sunrise. Uh, what has transpired, <laughs> which is true, uh, first of all, there, we knew this was going to end before Easter. There was no way he could make the Easter payout. So the question really became a timetable as to when was he planning on making his exodus and basically shutting the website down and being gone. So that was that was the only question mark in my mind is what, which day of the week and which week is it going to be. But before we could get to when I really thought this was going to collapse, uh, a, a lot of things started happening. All of a sudden, we had states coming out of the woodwork that were issuing cease and desist orders. They were issuing alerts, and it's just continued to snowball and mushroom. So we now have included them. And I'm not going to go through which states are just a cease and desist and which ones are just uh, alerts. I'm just going to list them all because it gets kind of confusing to try to separate who's who. So we've had Ohio, Wisconsin. We've had Nevada. Texas, New Mexico, South Dakota, North Dakota, California, Florida. Uh, we've had uh, Minnesota. All of these states have either issued a cease and desist or they have issued a warning or alert about profitable sunrise. And, and when you, you have to understand that North Carolina was a temporary order. He had 30 days to respond. These other states that have issued their cease and desist, it's immediate. They've shut them down in those states. They are no longer allowed to do business or conduct business in those states. They do. They continue to do it, and people that are promoting it in those states are subject to penalties and fines by the states. So it's, it's really mushroomed, and there's going to be more. The only question became, would, were the feds going to get involved? Were they going to move in and shut this down? The states have preempted that. doesn't mean that the feds still can't take action. There's a possibility that could happen. That's on the horizon. We don't know if that will happen or not. We just know that, you know, with the states being involved, we're sure that the federal authorities are, are know about it. They're probably researching and investigating. The one thing I want to clarify to a lot of people is because there's a lot of misinformation out there. They think that the states just acted out of the blue. One or two people complained, and then they just automatically issued this warning or they issued the cease and desist. That's not how this works. This has been in the works for quite some time. They have to do an investigation before they ever issue a cease and desist, or especially a cease and desist, or even if they are going to issue a warning or an alert. There has to be rationale and there has to be supporting documents and evidence for them to do that, or they could be – I mean, if – Roman was profitable sunrise was legal he could bring legal action against him and win so they have to you know when the states take these actions it's not just willy-nilly it's not out of the blue it's not just done because a couple of people complain there's far more involved in this and we will never know what all the complaints that led up to these actions being taken or how many there were but the bottom line is Again, in every one of these Ponzi's, there's always a lot of misinformation that's being pushed around, and of course, everybody wants to believe that it's not the end of it, that it's, you know, this is a mistake, it's all going to get rectified, everything's going to be wonderful, and unfortunately, that's not the case. Profitable Sunrise is no longer Profitable Sunrise. It's gone. Now, the thing that happened that was really interesting is, just as these states started issuing these cease and desist and also their alerts, the website went down, and the, there was no advance notice on this. They then issued a release and said, well, the site was down for maintenance because they were moving to new servers. Well, when you take a site down and it's under maintenance, there's a sign that pops up when you access the website, and it says site under maintenance, and it tells you that they're doing maintenance. When you t plug into Profitable Sunrise, it popped up and said it was a 502 or a 504, depending on which time of day you hit the site, was giving you a server error. 
that means the site's no longer there. It's gone. So this notion that they were down for 36 to 48 hours is basically giving him time for 36 to 48 hours before everybody starts flooding the states with all these complaints about they stole my money, what happened to it, where did it go? This just And like I said, it's just designed to get him out of town, uh, get away from the, the public spotlight, and so before all the complaints start hitting. So that's how this all kind of comes together. It happens almost in every Ponzi we've ever seen or been involved in, especially when they run with the money. There's always that announcement, you know, don't panic, the site's going down, and then, of course, it never comes back up. And it just buys time, and that's all it has bought. But now I think the reality is setting in. Uh, we're seeing this on a lot of the different forums where uh, many of the people go to report they, you know, they got paid, how wonderful the program is, and now all of a sudden they're posting, you know, what's going on, there's problems, uh, this can't be good. They're waking up to the fact that it's over. And there's still some that are still hanging on to – Yeah, and that's, that that, that's, what's surprising, that's what's surprising to me, Lynn, is in those forums, which I've started to visit myself, to notice – how many people are still hanging on to some degree of hope? And, and one of the things that I ask myself is, okay, if I'm Profitable Sunrise, and let's say I do need to do some maintenance or updating of my site, you know, and I'm assuming here for the sake of argument that they're still operating and everything's still fine, this would not be the time to pick to go do your maintenance when the presumption would be that you're out of business. So, so the idea that they just coincidentally decided to do uh, maintenance and be offline for a couple of days, quote unquote, uh, during the time that all of these state, and it's not just in the United States here, but also we had the same kind of uh, warnings and cease and desist orders coming out of Canada uh, as well. And I'm hearing that maybe some things may be coming out of New Zealand uh, also. But uh, it, it is amazing how people still hold out their hopes. And I want you to comment on that. And the second thing I want you to comment on is the idea. Lynn, that you and I are the reason that people lost their money, that if we had just kept our mouth shut, that this thing would have kept going and people would be just fine. And my response to that is, look, Roman Novak, if he's an honest businessman and he's been using this money to, to earn 3 or 4% a day on hard money loans, the fact that he's no longer able to continue to raise money doesn't stop him from repaying everybody all their money. The fact that he's that this business model of him bringing all this money in from people via this multi-level structure and, and all of this nonsense, even if that all went away, if Roman Novak is still sitting somewhere and he still has, he should have all of the money still. The state hasn't taken his money away at this point, and if they did, they'd be taking it away for the benefit of the investors. So people losing all their money, Lynn, that has nothing to do with you or me if people ever see a dollar again. Isn't that right? Oh, that's true. Uh, of course, there always has to be a scapegoat. And, of course, the the standard is it's a conspiracy theory. The states are out of money. The federal government's out of money, so they saw an easy money train, so they went and confiscated it so they could uh, cover the losses that they're incurring. You know, it's they're broke, so they're going to take every dollar they can get. We, we hear this all the time, all these different conspiracy theories. It's the evil government. It's the banks. You know, if you're going to investigate something, investigate Social Security, investigate the banking industry, investigate the mortgage industry. Uh, there's always a deflection because they can't deal with the reality and facts. And you're right. Action has been taken by four provinces in Canada and also New Zealand. I was only referencing the United States because that has the most dramatic impact for most of the people that are listening to us right now. But, yes, there's other – and expect more to come from other countries It's not, and probably more provinces in Canada – Again, it comes down to the fact that the biggest issue here is, is as you very readily pointed out, and people don't want to acknowledge, if he's if he was really doing what he said he was doing, the fact that they shut him down every state, he can still continue to pay because apparently, see, here here's where the the disconnect comes. What has been shut down is Profitable Sunrise. He says that Inter Reef Limited is the company that's doing the bridge loans. So if he's operating as Inter Reef Limited, he can still continue to do bridge loans. Nobody shut down Inter Reef Limited from doing bridge loans, even though he's not licensed or registered. And you and you know well you and you know because you've been in this long enough. If he were wherever he is, if he were to come to the United States and sit down with uh, the regulators and say, "Look, I blew it. I made a mistake. I should have been licensed. Here's all the money, and I'm going to bring all the I'm going to give all the money back and have it distributed out to the investors." 
Um, he could probably have walked away from this without really that significant of consequences if he was able to actually repay everybody and settle this. And that's really the big question now for those that are and – and I wonder about this psychology. I know you've dealt with a lot of these uh, Ponzi schemes, uh, Lynn. The person that's still sitting out there believing the website's going to come back up, believing they're going to get their money back, what's going on with that person psychologically that they still can't see the reality of what we're dealing with here? Well, the problem is they've been taught to believe, and they don't want to acknowledge that they may have been caught up in a scam or a Ponzi. Uh, there, there's denial. The first thing that always happens in these situations is they deny that uh, that what's being said is is reality. That and again, it's called the deflection of blame. The psychology on this is is really fascinating to me for this reason. The people who run these things are usually a sociopath, and they can also be a psychopath. It kind of varies between the two as to which personality is there. My gut feeling is is that Roman Novak is really more of a sociopath than a psychopath. And because a sociopath is a person who could sit down really right across the table from you and lie to you, everything he says is a, or she says is a lie. They firmly believe everything they said to you is the truth, and you believe it because they believe what they said. But everything they said was a total lie. And that's one of the problems that people have. They don't want to admit that they got taken. We have an ego pride issue. That's part of the process of denial. We have another part of us that says, you know what, I may have been blinded by greed, and they don't want to have to face the fact that they were blinded by greed, and that's why they got into this in the first place. They always get in with altruistic feelings, but after a while, let's be honest, we're all human. You get that kind of money being thrown at you, it becomes greed in a heartbeat, and I'm just as guilty of that as anybody else. I'm not saying something that I couldn't be guilty of as well, and I want people to understand that. I'm not coming from a holier-than-thou attitude. I'm just telling you what we've experienced over the almost nine years that I've been doing this, that what we've been seeing, in the, and it's the same from every Ponzi to every Ponzi, and what is ironic, it's some of the same people from Ponzi to Ponzi that have the same reaction every time, and you would think by the third or fourth time they would have wised up and learned. They don't, because they always think that this one's going to be different. This is the one that's going to be real. And I'm going to kick myself if I didn't get in it. That's how they get in it. That's why they're so reluctant to accept it when it finally goes bust, is that they just don't want to believe they got snuckered again. And this and is let, what happens. Let's, uh, to the let's talk about some of the players here. One of the fascinating characters in this story is a woman by the name of Nancy Jo Fraser, who I interviewed um, at, when I was writing my story back in February, and of course uh, subsequently, you know, filmed several. Uh, YouTube videos, and, and I and I became, <laughs> uh, in many ways, uh, kind of the, the public face of the uh, inquisition of Profitable Sunrise, although the truth being that people like yourself had put in far more time and months of, of, of research and investigation. I just happened to be more public with what I was doing, and, and as a result, got a chance to uh, talk to Nancy Jo Fraser, and um, her position um, all the way up until just recently has just been, hey, this is still fine. Everything's going great. We're, we're, you know, I'm on vacation now, but when I get back from my vacation, everything's going to uh, just be going you know, back to normal. Don't worry about the North Carolina cease and desist order. And this lady uh, seems to be um, uh, very fearless uh, about this. But now we're starting to uh, see some cracks uh, in the story. Nancy Joe Fraser of... Um, the NJF Global Group. Um, I'm hearing all kinds of strange stories, and maybe you can help us to understand what's happening. We know that she went on what was like a week and a half, almost a two-week vacation, right the day of the cease and desist order in North Carolina, which made me a little bit suspicious, but who knows? It was right around spring break, so maybe that legitimately was a vacation. But then it became very strange how there wasn't really very much communication during that time, people were told, don't email her, don't call her and leave any messages at her office. She's not to be disrupted during her vacation. During the vacation, we then got a couple of posts where she made uh, some posts on her website, just maybe once or twice, I believe, just sort of reassuring people everything's fine. Now the latest I'm hearing is that she is stepping down from NJF Global Group and someone else is going to be taking it over. She never realized that this was illegal how this was all being operated. Um, one of the messages that I got 
Uh, she's actually querying her list, asking them if they're getting subpoenas because the word is now out that many are receiving subpoenas uh, in her organization. And I believe she was the largest promoter in this. And I've heard numbers as high as 76,000 people in her multi-level network organization that was promoting uh, Profitable Sunrise. And now we're hearing something about she's disappeared again because the story is her son is having an emergency surgical procedure in Toledo. And, you know, again, I don't know what to believe anymore. All of this just seems surreal to me. Uh, Lynn, your thoughts? Well, first of all, let's go back to the prompt. You know, let's start from the time when we went on vacation. With a person who has this size of a group, and, it, and we've heard the same numbers, and we've heard numbers even higher than that, but again, the problem is you don't know. But by her own mouth, she says that of as high as 76,000 people have contacted her. doesn't mean all of them are involved in the program or actually joined. It just means that they've been in touch with or maybe become a product, have joined Focus Up Ministries, which that was the ticket into NJF. You had to get in to make a donation to Focus Up Ministries in order to be part of NJF. And then in NJF, you could then participate in the other programs that they were offering. And remember, she was involved in Zeke Rewards, and she was also out there promoting another program called uh, JPB, which just been paid, and also which that migrated into profit clicking. So uh, she's got a little history here that's not as clean as ever she'd like to profess it to be. But the fact that she went on vacation exactly at the time this announcement weighed, like you, it was suspicious to me. When that was made, I was going, wait a minute, something's up. She, she got advance warning because I understand. Before they make a press release, the parties involved are notified that this action is going to be taken. So there was a heads up. She was out of Dodge. She didn't want to face the music, and she figured she'd go out. She'd let other people handle it, and she did, like you said, made a couple little brief comments. Everything's fine, and then she comes back. Well, now we have a sympathy vote because we have checked, and we've gone to every hospital we know in Toledo that has a heliopad that would be able to, because she said that he was flown into the hospital for emergency surgery, and amazingly, none of those hospitals have a patient by the name of her son in those hospitals now is it possible yes uh but uh, but the plausibility is is that like everything else and as i told you once before you always can't believe everything you see you hear and you read you got to sit back and start doing the facts and doing you know doing the checking interesting story about this about the subpoenas now if she is in the situation she would not know about subpoenas because basically when you get a subpoena you're you're basically told not to tell anybody. This is between you and the whatever government agency is involved, and it's between you guys. It's not subject for open to discussion. So the fact that she even announced that she knew that there were subpoenas issued and there were subpoenas being issued was very uh, raised a lot of red flags to me. It tells me she's far deeper into this than she's ever professed. Of course, I know she is, but. It's it's starting. To, if people would sit back and look at this, they would start realizing she's more deeply involved than just her group. But she also has some other problems. Her biggest problem is the fact that we've checked out her 501c3, and she's not registered with the IRS as a 501c3. Focus Up Ministries does not exist in the IRS database for approved. And and this is something you we talked about on our last program that we did with right. you that she she is operating as a ministry. She says she is a minister, and she claims a 501c3 status, but yet you can't find anything for her under that status, and she's been collecting a lot of donations under that status. Um, but even if she was licensed, uh, did have the proper filings to be a 501c3, this is a rather odd business activity to be in, raising money for offshore hard money lending if that's the kind of you know organization that you're running wouldn't it wouldn't it be inappropriate regardless oh absolutely and so would being in Zeek rewards and so would be in profit clicking the fact that uh it, it just it just shows a pattern if you will that there's a lot of inconsistency and you're talking about somebody getting involved in something that's a ponzi and doesn't know it if you didn't learn anything after Zeke Rewards, you should have learned that you know profit clicking was a, was a Ponzi, and you should have known that 
Profitable Sunrise was a Ponzi. This notion that she saw all the documents that proved it was legitimate, therefore she could go out and do it. But more importantly, as she's promoting a security, she isn't saying that she is acting as a financial advisor. She's not licensed and registered to do so, so that puts her in violation as well. So there's a, a – in, in fact, her 501c3 is not even registered in the state of Ohio as an official – and I, you have to understand, I'm talking official now – the application process was the Secretary of State to just get the name filed and, and do that. That's the first step. The second step is get IRS approval and your state approval through your Attorney General's office that you can operate as a charitable giving organization. Neither one of those have been done. They're not on any registry list, and there's no application process that we've been able to cover. And usually the IRS has who's, in, who's applied and what's in process. It doesn't, she doesn't show up there, and she's been operating since 2009. So there's no excuse for not having this official status. But the other side of the coin is we have not been able to verify that her son really is in the hospital. I think it's more smoke and mirrors to deflect things away from her to get the heat off of her from the people wanting to come after her because who you going to you're not going to attack a mother whose son is in the hospital having an emergency <laughs> and, and surgery. You know, and people listening to this are going to say you two cynical men. Well look, there's a point at which you have to stop giving people um, credibility. There's a point at which you know the benefit of the doubt is no longer there, and that's the case with Nancy Joe Fraser. She no longer has any benefit of the doubt with me or Lynn and lots of other people. And as we continue to talk about Nancy Joe and her NJF Global Group and all of this, um, you know I've had, and this will segue into you know the, the second part of this question, which is who is Roman Novak? I've had this feeling all along how strongly she vouches for Roman Novak and how important of a person he is in her life, as she said uh, on, on one of the recordings. It seems awfully strange how strongly she is supportive of a guy that she just met not very long ago and, according to the story, has probably only spoken to him by phone. I don't think she ever claims to have met this mystery character Roman Novak in person. And just something, you know, I'm speculating here and I'm just wondering, is it possible that some of these top promoters, including Nancy Joe Fraser, that maybe there really is no Roman Novak, that maybe this is a ruse? Because who is Roman Novak? We can't find him in any of the corporate documents for Interreef Limited. This is like a person that doesn't exist. And if this guy is this big business person that's been around for decades doing hard money lending, why can't why can't you know we can't find him we can't find any trace of this guy anywhere uh your thoughts on who is Roman Novak Lynn and and could this all just be a made up story and maybe some some guy is playing the role of Roman Novak well that's the that's the biggest that's the big question uh here here's the situation we actually have been in contact with an individual who said that his mother knows Roman Novak and has known him for 25, 26 years. And so we are in the, in the course of discussing with this and getting some more information and background, and the story is, is from this individual that he really does exist. Now, we know that there was a voice that claimed to be Roman Novak because he was interviewed on YouTube, and we, we've listened to the audio tapes, and we know that this person claimed he was Roman Novak. But that's all we know in that situation. There was a Roman Novak that is in Florida, but is it the Roman Novak that's in Florida? It's in the Orlando area. We have phone numbers that go to a totally different company name, which also is not licensed or registered in the state of Florida as a business. And forget about securities, but as a business, there is no registration for Profitable Sunrise or Interreef Limited as a business in Florida or any other state in which they do business. So that's the big question mark, and unfortunately I can't address anything further on that because of things that are in the process and, and confidentiality. But let me just say that we are really interested in this individual, and we're talking to him, at least so far he's been very willing to talk to us. And so we're discussing with him the situation to get some more, as, get as much com confirmation as we possibly can. But that doesn't mean that the Roman Novak that his mother knew is the real Roman Novak's behind Profitable Sunrise. Again, it's it's a long, arduous process that we go through to verify everything that you hear and what you see and what's real and what's fake. And 
we've been following Profitable Sunrise since about August of last year. It's not something that just popped up with us. We've been after it for a long time, and we've been searching, and we've been digging, and we've been doing all the things that we do as a as legal research so that when we get documentation and evidence and information that we know that would stand up in court, we pass that on to our law enforcement contacts that we have, that we have assigned agents from different agencies, and we provide that information to them depending on what type of uh, Ponzi it is. It depends on who we go to with that information. And so – we pass all that information on. All we do is research and provide information. I wish we had subpoena power. I wish we had arrest power. We don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, and, nice. you, and you guys are doing a, a great job with the uh, limited resources that you have, and we greatly appreciate all that you've helped us with the, the articles. I'm going to put you on hold, Lynn. We're going to take a break. We're going to take a four-minute break, so if you want to Stretch your legs, get a new cup of coffee or water, whatever you're drinking over there. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the other promoters in Profitable Sunrise, maybe some of the names that you haven't heard before, because it's not all just about Nancy Joe Fraser. We'll take a break. We'll be back in four minutes. Stand by. Hi, this is Jim Paris, editor-in-chief of the website ChristianMoney.com. If you are interested in learning some new strategies for generating online income, check out my free training schedule at jimsfreetraining.com. That's jimsfreetraining.com. Whether you're just looking for part-time income or to build an Internet business that can replace your full-time job, check out this free online workshop coming up this week. Register now at jimsfreetraining.com. The workshops are free, but are each limited to just 250 people. So take a minute now and reserve your space for my next free online workshop. That's jimsfreetraining.com. jimsfreetraining.com. Are you tired of hearing how the economy is doing so badly and how there are no opportunities? This is Jim Paris, and I want to share with you an opportunity that I first learned of a little over a year ago, right here in my own neighborhood. I was out walking my dog and saw someone cleaning a foreclosed house, and I struck up a conversation with them and actually found out that there is a business opportunity of cleaning out foreclosed homes for the banks, and these people don't make pennies. In fact, some of them make as much as $1,000 to $1,500 for one day of cleaning out foreclosed houses. Now what's really neat about this opportunity is that the foreclosure crisis isn't going anywhere. So this is an opportunity that's going to be around for years to come. Uh, it's an interesting business opportunity, one that I think really does deserve your attention. And there's a website that you can go to to get all of the details on this opportunity. It's called foreclosurecleaning.us. Now, maybe you want to do this just part-time, maybe just on the weekends or, or in the evenings. Uh, it's an opportunity that is very unique, and with everything that's happening in the economy today, it's something that's actually growing and expanding while many other things are drying up and withering. Uh, it's, it's a unique opportunity, uh, one that I think uh, will give you a chance to maybe become self-employed, uh, get out of the rat race, an opportunity to get into a whole new line of work, and it doesn't take very much money at all to start a business like this, and it doesn't take very much training. After all, you're just doing basic cleaning. To find out more about the exploding foreclosure cleaning business, check out the website foreclosurecleaning.us. That's foreclosurecleaning.us. Hi, this is Jim Paris, and I want to share with you something really unique that I ran across recently. It's an idea that I think would be very, very interesting to many of our listeners. How would you like to get paid to travel internationally and actually live in a foreign country for maybe a year or even longer? Uh, it's a unique opportunity, and it doesn't take a lot to get involved in this. The opportunity is that of teaching English as a foreign language. Now, I'm going to give you a website here that you can go to to get more information on this. It's called MakeMoneyTeaching.us. That's MakeMoneyTeaching.us. 
teaching.us. Now, at the website, you're going to learn all about a unique opportunity where you can become certified to teach English as a foreign language. Now, you don't have to go back to college, and it won't take you years to get this certification. In just a matter of a few weeks, you can become certified to teach English as a foreign language. Uh, there are organizations that will actually pay you and actually pay your transportation costs as well uh, to bring you into a foreign country. And you might live there for a year or longer. Uh, many of the arrangements even include paid housing. Now, if you're someone that doesn't want to travel internationally, uh, you can also take this same training and use this credential to teach right here in the United States or even over the Internet using Skype. Take a couple of minutes today and check this out. It's definitely a very interesting opportunity that I think deserves your attention. Again, the website is MakeMoneyTeaching.us. That's MakeMoneyTeaching.us. All right. Hello, everybody. We are back. My name is Jim Paris. And you're listening to Jim Paris Live. However, this particular episode is not live. This was pre-recorded on Friday afternoon. And uh, we're recording this because I'm not available on Sunday night. So today is March the 15th, the date we're recording this. Just in case other developments may occur, we want to make sure that we have the date out there. And my guest is Lynn Edgington. And Lynn is the founder of Eagle Research. And he's a scam buster. And Lynn, before we go any further, tell people about your website and your book and, and all that and how they can get in touch with you. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, our website is www.eagleresearchassociates.org. And if you forget and put in .com, you'll still get there. Uh, on, the, on our website, uh, you'll find resources that are available to you for every U.S. state that you want to file an online complaint. We have the ability to do that. We have all the national agencies for the United States. We have every province of Canada. We have agencies completely around the world where you can go there and you can click on file a complaint. We also have a lot of other information here. We have additional resources page. And on that, we provide links to other organizations that are educating to help warn you about other types of Ponzi's and other types of scams that are out there so you don't become a victim. So there's a ton of stuff there. There's a, I think there's over 500 and some links that we have on our website that you can, that are there for you to get educated and to help you. And also there's a link there for my book. It's down in the lower left-hand column. You'll see the article about the book. You click on it. It takes you to our link, and it tells you what's in the book. It tells you about people who purchased the book. And the name of my book is Robbing You with a Keyboard Instead of a Gun, Cybercrime, How They Do It. And it is available on Amazon.com. But it gives you a chance to get a feeling for people who have actually purchased the book and read it. It talks about people that have commented about my book as well that know me personally. And also it gives you a summary uh, list of all the chapters that are in the book so you can see what's, what the content is. And so, like I said, it also has a direct link to Amazon if you're interested in purchasing it. But uh, that's how you find us. And then there's a Contact Us link. And if you want to contact me, which many of you have done, and I appreciate every contact, uh, send me an email and I will personally respond to you. If you call me at my phone number, I will personally talk to you. You're not going to get a voicemail unless I'm out of the office, but you will talk to a live human being, and that live human being is me. So you don't have to worry about being passed around uh, through voicemail and dial, punch this if, if you need this, or punch that if you need something different. You get me. So that's who we are. That's what we do. Okay, so it's eagleresearchassociates.org. Yes. Is that right? Okay, good, good, good. That's correct. All right. Let's talk about some of the other characters in this story. And am, am I right? Is it correct that there were 20 so-called private groups? There were 20 organizations that were selected by Roman Novak, if he's even real, uh, to be the first level promoters. Is that the case? Well, we, we've been told there's 20. There may have been more than that, but primarily out of that 20 that we were originally told about, there's really only six or seven that were really huge, and those are the ones that we kind of focused on. You kind of get lost in the myriad of all the other ones because they, you know, when I say huge, and I'm talking, uh, you know, at least 5,000 people or more in each one of these groups. And so from that standpoint, that to us is what was on our radar. There's a bunch of them out there that are 500, 100. Was, was Nancy so, Joe Fraser, as far as you know, the biggest group? As far as I know, she was by far the largest. 
And uh, you there, know, there were actually five besides her that were over. That I, my understanding was is there's at least five that were over five thousand, and I think a couple of those were over twenty thousand. Do you know the name Doctor Gotti Ood? Oh yes. <laughs> Tell us about Doctor Gotti I have a laugh. Ood. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Now, is this someone that's operating here in the United States, or are they overseas? Uh, they're in Canada. They're in Canada. In okay. Montreal. Tell us about Dr. Gotti Ood. That's a name I'm seeing a lot as I'm looking into the story now. Kind of a new name to me because I've been focused on Nancy Joe Fraser, but now this new name comes in, Dr. Gotti Ood. Tell us about who he is. Well, basically, he he claims to be a pastor. Uh, he claims to be a teacher. Uh, he claims a lot of things. Uh, I use the term doctor loosely because uh, I've never been able to confirm that he ever got his doctor in theology or doctor of anything else, uh, whether it be just getting a master's degree. I've never been able to confirm that he really was a doctor, but uh, that's not the issue. The, the problem is, is that he's one of these that's constantly going out there and promoting all the different Ponzi scams that are, are across the board. I mean, he, I think at one time I used to get his newsletter, and I counted at one time he had something like 15 different Ponzi's that were in his – every one of them was a Ponzi, but yet this was supposed to be a way to make additional money. It was legitimate. You know, it's the real deal. And then, of course, they all go belly up, and then there's always an excuse as to why it went belly up, but it was never his fault. It was always somebody else's fault, and it's people like me that cause these things and people like you that cause these things to go down. So we're responsible, not the players involved. So, you know, we understand that. We played this game for too many years, so it doesn't hurt his feelings. In fact, he's kind of like, well, if you want to give us credit for it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. You're not hurting my feelings if you do. It's like you, you think I'm going to go cry. Uh, no, I'm not going to go cry. I, I'm making light of it in this regard because there's nothing that this – we have. I have never seen him promote anything. And I mean this, any, and I'm talking over a six-year period of time. I've never seen anything he's ever put in any one of his newsletters that was a legitimate program. And now, it just there, there defies were, description that people keep falling for yeah, this stuff. These characters, you wonder where they come from. It's almost like we're in a Batman movie or something. Uh, yeah. So, so we've got the Joker and the Riddler. Now let's talk about some of the other people. Um, there are other people. Let's let's talk about these characters who. Um, they published a video that we got our hands on, and then we republished that over at ProfitableSunriseInvestigation.com, where the video starts out, first of all, they're saying they're not going to record what they're, they're doing. It's not going to be recorded. <laughs> and then it is recorded because they, <laughs> they recorded it because we would have had no other way to get it if it wasn't recorded. So now we get this recording, and the guy starts out. I wish I had done a clip of this so we could play it. But this was in reaction to – the first uh, interview that I did with you, and that's the interview that I think blew the top off this thing where you started naming names and, and giving dates and giving details. Well, he says that they started listening to this interview where I'm interviewing uh, you, and he just shook his head, and then he laughed, and he just knows that this whole deal is legitimate. He's more convinced than ever that it's legitimate. Now, this is all post the North Carolina cease and desist order, that he's exuding all of this confidence in how good this program is and how he feels. He said something like, I believe in the legitimacy of this more now than ever. Who is this guy and his sidekick, uh, and how do they fit into this whole deal? Well, actually, they were part of uh, Nancy Joe's group. John Simmons was one of them. He's, he is a, is a pastor, and he's their director of operations, I think, for NGF Global. So he is actually part of Nancy's group, and the other gentleman is also part of that group, and his first name was Ralph, and I apologize if I mispronounced the last name. It was Mercus or Merkies. Uh, uh, it's M-E-R-K-E-S, I believe is the way he spells it. Uh, and I apologize if I mispronounced his name. I didn't mean to. But the bottom line is, is they're all part of Nancy Joe's group. So they're not outside the scope, and, of course, they're basing their assumptions on – and I firmly believe that the only reason why they believe this is because they believe what Nancy Joe told them. And so, that would involve uh, Dave Steckel also? Uh, Dave Steckel, there's 
yeah, there's a there's a bunch of people. There's there, the problem is is you, know, you have so many people inside Nancy Joe's organization. You don't even that know. You put and, any of them and, up on a YouTube, and you wouldn't know if they were or not unless they just specifically identified. And one themselves. of the things, Lynn, I've never asked you this before, but but we're now on our. I think this is our third interview, so I can get into some maybe some uh, new areas. I noticed some really strange. Uh, phrases that were used in some of these conference calls that we ended up receiving from different sources. Um, and, and I almost wondered if there's a cult-like air to this whole deal. I heard a phrase uh, several times where they would say something like this. They're introducing Nancy Joe Fraser, and they would say, the opportunity that Nancy has gifted to all of us. And they would use that phrase, and, and I, I can't remember the others, but there were some other phrases like that that just stood out to me as not just being weird, but almost cult-like. And uh, I had heard that uh, that there's quite a lot of Scientologists who were involved in this as well, and it just started making me wonder, um, what's really behind all of this? Is Is this almost like a cult that's going on here? Unfortunately, it is like a cult, and you see all this. If you really, you know, and of course the people that are in it take terrible offense when I use that term, and I've used it before, and I never say, well, it is a cult. I always say it's cult-like, because if you look at what the definition of a cult is, and you look at what's happening inside with anybody that dares raise an issue and speaks out against, that person is attacked mercifully. They make them shut up. It's through fear and intimidation that you'll never raise another question again because you'll be shouted down by everybody else and you're you know you become a naysayer you become a troll you become a negative person you don't understand it you know get educated before you open your mouth i mean and they you know and but i mean it's really vicious they, there's nothing there's not a politeness about this they want all dissent stifled they do not allow dissent same thing that happens in a cult so you know there, as i said it's cult like Sometimes they do become cults, but people don't like that. But they are cult-like. Every anybody that gets into one of these things almost become because they will not listen to anyone that dares challenge the program. Even I don't care how factual it is, I don't care how much proof you have, they don't want to hear it. They have an excuse that they've been told to respond to you and ignore you. And they and that's why right now you see what we're seeing right now is the calm before the storm. Because the reality is now sinking in that it's gone. It still hasn't resonated with the vast majority of the people in Profitable Sunrise. This is gone. When it does, you're going to hear horror stories. How long like does that take, Lynn? How, how long before that sets in that this is really gone? It's going to be Monday, Tuesday of next week before it really starts sitting in, and it's going to be up to two weeks with a lot of people because you understand there are and there, this thing's around the world. It's not just here in the United States or Canada. It's around the world, and you've got a lot of people that – and Nancy Joe's group was pushing this heavily in the Asian communities in Asia. I'm getting uh, – I'm, uh, I'm looking at my traffic log to my website and blog, and I'm getting hits from Africa – from Japan, um, I'm getting emails from Nigeria. We're getting hits from Belgium and England and Germany and Australia and New Zealand and emails from lots of those places as well. And are we sure that this is only a $100 million deal, Lynn, or, or could we be talking about something much larger than that? Well, actually, uh, to be I kind of had to fudge a number a little bit when we've talked before because you understand there's the restrictions that I have because of the associations that we have and the organizations we work with. Now that this now that these actions have been taken, I can now be more open about it. And I didn't mean to deceive anybody, but it's just that I can't just come out and tell what all I know because certain things have to happen before I can even make any announcements. And we don't even know when their actions are going to be taken. So I don't want anybody to think that I have advance notice of any of these state regulatory agencies doing what they're doing, or even if the feds decide to do something, I'm not going to get a phone call and tell me they're going to do it before they do it. I find out about it like everybody else when the public announcement is made. But there's information I have that I couldn't share. We really truly believe that this is probably in the vicinity of 400, maybe $450 million dollars. Worldwide. Wow. Wow. So we're, get, we're getting into half a billion. Getting into real numbers. Yeah, we're getting into real numbers. And 
the thing that really is about this, and this is the one thing that people, you see, when you're thinking about just you and what you invested in it and what the Easter payout was supposed to be for just you, even though it's astronomical in one sense, it still seems possible. Mm-hmm. Because if I take five hundred dollars and they, you know, if I, well, I'm not going to use five hundred because the number gets just totally out of whack. Let's just say a hundred dollars. If I put a hundred dollars in, and I left it in for two hundred forty days, and I got two point seven percent interest, I mean, when I look at what I'm getting back, it's it's astronomical compared for a hundred dollar investment. But if I only look at my number and I don't consider everybody else doing the same thing. It doesn't become impossible. So a hundred dollars becomes uh, about sixty thousand at that rate over two hundred and forty days uh, at two point seven percent. So somebody and, like and you you're have saying, to sit back and say, you know, there's no way that can be done. But it, it, it's like, okay, well, it may, you know, hey, it's just me. You know, it's, you're only thinking about you, your number. But think about this for a moment. Let's assume for just one little second that everybody everybody that was in has only put $100 in. Well, now, we know that's not true, but anyway, just for simplicity, everybody that's in it put in $100. And let's say there are 150,000 people that did that. <laughs> now, oh, my goodness. Just on $100, for Easter alone, think of the number he has to pay out. Now, consider that it may have been $225 million dollars and two hundred twenty-five million dollars, earning interest at two point seven percent. Well, just on your first example, uh, if there was one hundred and fifty thousand people only, and they were each owed sixty thousand um, dollars, I'm coming up with nine trillion here. Uh, three zeros, three zeros, three zeros. Uh, yeah, if I'm doing this right, I mean it's like my calculator can't even absorb all of these figures and. Uh, I guess as as we're closing it out with just seven or eight minutes left here, one of the big questions we're getting hit with from people is, okay, what do I do now? And it's it's a hard question to answer because it's like, well, you shouldn't have been playing with matches and you burn your house down. What do I do now to save my house? And and you know, other than calling their state regulators, getting all their records together so that they can be a partner with the regulators and trying to maybe get some of this money back. I know you've said that the money could be gone that the top guy got, but they might be able to do clawbacks that is taking money back from the top promoters, uh, ill-gotten gains, if you will. Um, what normally happens on a deal like this? Are we talking a nickel on the dollar, a penny on the dollar that people might be able to see at some point, or is that even too optimistic? Actually, when they run with the money, it's too optimistic. And I say this for this reason. The only recourse you have once you realize it's over is you've got to file with IC3.gov. And that's that's just a reporting agency that they will then take your complaint and forward it to the proper law enforcement agency that would be involved in investigating that that type of crime. So that's IC, the the letter I, the letter C, and then the number 3, IC3.gov? Yes. Okay. And – you want to file a complaint, and again, when you file that complaint, you want to you want to have all your bank wire communications, you want to have all your payment processor communications, the amount of monies you deposited in, even the amount of money you got back. You have to document everything, any phone calls you made, any emails you got, any uh, your bank statements, anything that documents that you sent X Y Z dollars there and you got X Y dollars back. That is critical information that they're going to need in the investigation, both at the federal level and also with your state regulator. So you need to file with IC3, and you need to file with your state attorney general's office. Here's the rub. The only time they can do clawbacks is when assets are frozen. They get the whole database of the person who was running the Ponzi, so they know who all the players are. So they have a record, and they can find out where all the money went to what payment processes, how much went in, how much has come back, and they have to be able to freeze not only the bank accounts where they for let's say for Roman Novak, but they often have to freeze all of the payment processors accounts that had to deal with profitable sunrise. Then you have a court appointed receiver that's going to do a clawback against the people that were the big winners like they're doing in Zeke Rewards. Well, you don't have a freezing of assets here. The assets are gone. 
the only choice you have is usually is suing the person who got you in it. And here comes the rub. Usually the person getting you in it was either your best friend, your family member, uh, could be your pastor, it could be somebody in your church, it could be somebody in your Bible study group. I mean, it's going to be somebody that you are on a personal relationship with. Hmm. And then it comes down to, are you really going to sue them to get your money? It's now, some of, some of these people, could they become double victims, Lynn, in that they have lost their money that they invested, but then by bringing others in, they're actually making money off of the the deal that they believe to be legitimate. You know, we're talking about lower-level players here, not the Nancy Joe Frasers, but the lower-level people, that they might be getting a bill at the end of this. Not only did they lose all their money, but they might be getting – uh, a, a bill to pay back what they might have earned off of the recruiting side of this? Very impossible to answer that, really. Uh, the odds are no, it wouldn't happen. The The problem that you have with this is this. The, you, the ones that really are right now at the biggest risk and have the biggest exposure and responsibility for this and could be held accountable for is everybody, uh, Nancy Joe Fraser, for everybody that's in her group, Anybody that had a large group, uh, and I named some of them the last time, but, you know, go down the list of, you know, all those groups, whoever had a group that was in this special category, they have now put themselves at risk to be subject to suits by the people that they got into this program. But again, the people you got into the program have the same dilemma that you have. Are they going to sue you to get their money back that they lost from you because they're your friend as well? And the person that got you in it is your personal friend. So who are you going to sue? Yeah, now, and, the other and, problem you have is this, <laughs> and it's a very critical part. Just because you can sue them doesn't mean you're going to get paid. You could go into court and win a judgment. Right, get, get a judgment, but money. then uh, good luck in collecting that. And just so that yeah, people exactly. aren't confused, Lynn is using the – editorial you. He's not really referring to me. because uh, The reason I say that, Lynn, is I've had a lot of people contact me saying, you're just mad because you were in it and you didn't make enough money or because you didn't get in it. And somehow there, I have one, I, I've got all these theories that are flying around on the internet about what my motivation is. One person said that he knows for sure that I'm a CIA operative and that the uh, government uh, had me take this down. Um, another person has given me the nickname the cheerleader of death. And then another person says that uh, they know that I've been paid by someone, that somehow someone is paying me to bring this down because uh, I'm getting uh, somehow getting compensated. Someone else said that Nancy Joe Fraser got selected for a private group and I didn't, and this is now my payback because I didn't get a private group because I really wanted to be in this all along. And I won't even mention the physical threats, which none of them struck me as – legitimate, although I am a concealed carry weapons permit holder, and I do carry a concealed weapon, and I am uh, training towards my second degree black belt in Taekwondo. So I say that that I feel pretty secure in being able to take care of myself, but if any of these threats do get any more serious, I am going to send them to law enforcement, just putting everybody on full and fair disclosure. But this does get rather personal, doesn't it, Lynn? Uh, the, the, the name calling, the threats, uh, questioning the integrity of, of those like us that are the accusers here, wondering what our financial motivation could be. Uh, in fact, uh, right now, I sent out an email last night uh, asking some of my supporters uh, to make a donation towards the bandwidth uh, costs that I'm incurring right now for these videos that I'm running. I had to put videos on my own server so that they weren't knocked off of YouTube because if I put someone else's recording up on YouTube, they could challenge it with YouTube and get it taken down. Whereas if I put it on my own server, they can't make me take it down. So in doing that, I'm paying uh, what's turning out to be hundreds of dollars in bandwidth fees. So I've got uh, people who are you know, my, my close-knit followers who are chipping in money to help me pay the bandwidth costs. So this is not a money maker <laughs> for me or you, but uh, we've only got about 45 seconds left. Uh, Lynn, close us out with what you expect to happen uh, this next week or two. Well, the biggest thing we're going to hear is all the horror stories. 
uh, that's going to be the when reality sets in, where the horror stories are going to come out, and we're going to hear horror stories like we've never heard. Uh, it's going to wrench your heart. Uh, we're talking the Christian community has been built out of hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's always a bad thing because that's money that could have been spent for furthering the king, kingdom advancement, and it's now not available. Uh, and it was all done under the name of this is blessed by God. That's one of the things that really struck me about this, and I hate that when it happens because that's one of my first signs it's a Ponzi. I hate to say that, but that's usually what they do. They prey on the Christian community. So, and, Lynn, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cut you short because we are out of time. Lynn Edgington of Eagle Research Associates, thank you so much for being with us. Your help has been invaluable. This is Jim Paris here, as always, to help you make the most of God's money. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to Jim Paris Live. For more information about our program, visit ChristianMoney.com or send an email to Jim at ChristianMoney.com. Join us next week for another live program.